right now I am in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which really is no surprise. I'm out here so much I'm thinking about having my mail forwarded out here. Uh, but more specifically, we are right here at the World War II American Experience Museum, which has one of the most incredible uh, World War II vehicle collections of any place that, that I've ever seen. Uh, we, we've done a few videos from here that, that I'll link in the description, but there are constantly new things coming in and out of this museum, new things going on display. Uh, so we're going to dodge inside. Got, uh, got a few friends that we're going to uh, link up with and uh, yeah, see what's new here at uh, the World War II American Experience. We just uh, rolled into the museum here and uh, holy smokes, they have been busy since I was here last. There is a lot of changes that have happened here at the museum since my last visit. And uh, happen to have someone else here with me today. We got uh, Jared Frederick uh, from the YouTube channel Real History. So if you're into movies and history, which why wouldn't you be? Uh, his, his channel is top notch. But anyway, uh, they also have some uh, reenactors here today. Jared's more into to that world than what I am. So uh, yeah, we're, we're just gonna see what there is to see. All right, so we just walked back into the main part of the museum. And uh, again, man, there have just been so many changes since I've been here last. So, so now, as you walk into the back part of the museum before you get to the vehicles, and again, if you see the other videos that I've done, you'll, you'll be able to see the changes. Uh, but we kind of get immersed into the home of an American family in the 1940s. So you can see we've got uh, some, some Life magazines here, American Home. But uh, yeah, kind of, kind of uh, again, as the name of the museum implies, uh, kind of bringing you into the experience. I think one of the most compelling things about the World War II home front is that it was all-consuming in nature. And there was this expectation placed upon citizens during the war that regardless of whether you were seven years old or 70 years old, you were going to be contributing to the war effort in one form or another. If you were either too young or too old for military service, you were going to be doing scrap drives, victory gardens, war bond fundraising, and all of these organic activities that were meant to assist some greater common cause, uh, even if you were contributing to it on the other side of the globe. And along these lines, I fondly recall some conversations that I had with my late grandmother who worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad during the conflict. And she said, despite all of the heartache and all of the suffering that people were feeling during the war, there was a sense of togetherness, there was a sense of unity, there was a notion that we are all in this together. And all in all, she said that it was an incredible time to be alive. That despite all of the immense loss of life, that there was an awareness and there was a gratefulness for being alive and being able to carry out your greater mission for your country. Now, as I've already mentioned, they have added a lot of new things here at the museum since I was here last, and we're, we're going to just focus in on a few of them. Not not all of them, but we'll, we'll kind of show a, a few things here. Uh, one item that they have is Admiral Yamamoto's rank flag that was taken from the Nagato on August 30th of 1945. So uh, Yamamoto was on the Nagato when the um, Pearl Harbor attack took place uh, and then of course Yamamoto died in 1943 but uh, the, the flag stayed with the ship and uh, yeah then ended up uh, being taken and came to the United States wow that is something else 
All right, uh, we just got back into the, the vehicle part of the museum, and they have quite a bit going on here today. There's some living historians, as I've mentioned, and they also have guests coming through. Uh, and they're also working on the tanks as well. So anyway, if you, if you hear some background noise, uh, yeah, that's, that's what's going on. Now here's something that is new to the museum, or at least new since I've been here last, and this thing is cool as heck. This is a 1943 Indian motorcycle, and uh, just like any vehicle or artifact, the, the story that is attached to this thing is really cool. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, Adam you know, works here, so he, he knows it better than I do. Uh, but something that's kind of interesting, the U.S. sent a whole bunch of these over to the British uh, during World War II, and uh, there was a story that Adam was telling me where uh, a U-boat sank a ship that had 2,200 of these uh, on board. So there are a bunch of these Indians sitting at the bottom of the Atlantic somewhere. All right, we're standing here in front of one of the coolest bikes, in my opinion. This is a 1943 Indian 741, and this bike is completely unrestored, never been touched. Now, what's really cool about this, it was essentially a barn find in 2007 when it was found in the garage of John W. Strauss. And now John Strauss was an executive with Macy's Department Store, and it was his grandparents that were one of the founders of the department store. Now his grandparents, an interesting story about them, Isidore and Ida Strauss, unfortunately they went down on a Titanic. And Isidore's wife uh, was able to get a spot on one of the lifeboats, but she did not want to leave her husband, so she chose to stay with him on the Titanic, and she sent her assistant in her place. Now, if you watch the movie Titanic, and we're talking about the 1997 version, I believe it's a scene where the older couple is in the bed and the water's coming up. That is Isidore and Ida Strauss, and they are incorporated into almost every Titanic movie. So a little bit of background about them. Now, John W. Strauss, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with the motorcycle? John Strauss, being an executive at Macy's, they sold some, some surplus bikes after World War II, and that is how he got this particular Indian motorcycle. Now, John Strauss was also a consultant on the set of oh, a miracle on 34th Street, and he also taught free French how to fly fighter planes in the States during the wartime, uh, during the Second World War. So he got this bike surplus, he rode it up until 1953, and then he parked it in his garage in New York State behind his 1938 Bugatti, one of 40 built of that particular body style. So this is truly a time capsule. It even has the original battery in it from World War II, the original spark plug, which still says Indian on it. And on the back, it still has this 1953 New York license plate, the last time it was on the road and registered. All right, so much has uh, changed since I've been in here last. I know I've said that a few times already. Now, I've seen all of these uniforms before, but, but they now have them on display. So as people come here, you know, they can be looking and seeing you know, where their grandpa or great-grandpa served and, and match it up with his uniform. Uh, so for example, right here, the uh, Alaska Command, that's, uh, that was my grandpa's unit. Uh, now, I, I've had people on previous videos before comment, you know, asking, you know, what does Gettysburg have to do with World War II? It actually has to do a, a lot. Uh, and if you say that to Jared Frederick, uh, well, those, those are fighting words. Many people may be wondering, why a World War II museum in Gettysburg? To some people, this may seem a little bit ahistorical. But I can tell you what. World War II history belongs in Gettysburg as much as Civil War history does. Like so many other national parks during that conflict, these public lands were mobilized and throughout the 1940s there were psychological warfare training units that were located at Gettysburg. On the very fields of Pickett's Charge there were 800 German prisoners of war that resided there so they could go out and pick fruit on the neighboring farms. The National Cemetery that Abraham Lincoln consecrates in 1863 is expanded following World War II. And in 1950, General Dwight Eisenhower purchases a Civil War era farmstead and makes it his summer White House and retirement home. That's just the tip of the iceberg in regard to the World War II history that can be found in Gettysburg. And what we always have to be mindful of is that 1863 was not the end of military history at Gettysburg, it was the beginning.
Now, when you come to the World War II American experience, uh, you know, the, the show pieces are probably the Sherman tanks. Uh, so again, we have a video where I got to drive one of these. But look at what just came in last week. Uh, this is an M36 tank destroyer. Uh, this has been out for restoration for the past four years, so this is my first time seeing it. And uh, this thing is cool as heck. And I'll admit that I don't know a whole lot about tank destroyers. So uh, yeah, I think we're gonna grab Adam Buck and uh, yeah, he, he's got a lot more in his head uh, than I do, especially when it, when it comes to armored vehicles. Okay, I'm standing here in front of an M36 tank destroyer, 1944. And this one just finished a three year restoration with mil spec vehicle restorations. Uh, and you can see here, it's got a very large main gun on it. This is the 90 millimeter gun. So I'll backtrack a little bit on the history of this particular piece. Initially, this was built in 1944 as an M10 tank destroyer. Now an M10 tank destroyer has a three inch main gun. Has a turret similar to this, although the sides would be more angular where this turret is rounded. Uh, what was happening though, the, the M10 tank destroyers, they were a good tank destroyer, but they weren't good enough. The three inch gun wasn't good enough against the Panther tanks, the Tiger tanks. So this was sent from Ford Motor Company to Schenectady, New York to American Locomotive Works where it was updated as an M36 tank destroyer with the 90 millimeter gun. Now a 90 is a big gun and that round could penetrate the armor on a Tiger or a Panther tank, which they did in many circumstances. Now, a tank destroyer. What is a tank destroyer? It looks like a tank, but it's not a tank. A tank destroyer is main, main mission is to destroy other tanks. Seek, strike, destroy. Get in there, pop a round off, and get out of there. Tank destroyers have an open top turret. Uh, that helps with reducing the overall weight. Uh, they usually have a larger gun. Uh, an M18 Hellcat would be another tank destroyer. That would have a 76 millimeter main gun. Now this one weighs about 32 tons. And uh, you can see the markings on the front are for the 692nd Tank Destroyer Battalion. We have a good friend named Jack Myers who lives in Maryland. He served in that unit in World War II and he will be 100 in a couple months. So like a Sherman tank, this has a five-man crew. You have your driver, assistant driver up in the turret. You have your tank commander, gunner, and loader. Now some interesting history about this particular tank destroyer. After World War II, the US supplied Yugoslavia with a lot of tank destroyers through mutual aid. And this was one of those pieces. So it was used by the Yugoslavians. Now the Yugoslavians, uh, Marshal Tito, they became friendly with the Soviets then. And so the supply was cut off. They could no, no longer get the parts for the Ford GAA uh, tank engine that's in this. So they, they pulled that engine out and put a Russian uh, V12 T55 tank engine in it. Great engine, uh, puts out a lot of smoke. So when we bought this tank, we brought it in from England and it had been in Slovenia before that. And then obviously Yugoslavia before that. Uh, but it had the Russian T55 engine like I said before, we, we just had it restored inside and out and put the original Ford GAA 500 horsepower, 1100 cubic inch tank engine back in it. So it's a very nice piece now. Okay, so uh, Adam just uh, invited me to uh, hop inside this tank destroyer and uh, take a look. Well, obviously the answer to that is going to be a definite yes. So uh, we're, we're gonna jump inside this thing and uh, yeah, take a look at it and see how it's maybe a little bit different from the, the Sherman or, or look at the differences. All right, we just got up here on top of this tank destroyer and uh, this thing is really, really interesting to me. I've never been on one of these before. Uh, as we've already mentioned, this is an open top turret, uh, which makes it 
it really, I don't know, just kind of unique if you're used to looking at Shermans all the time. Uh, I like the idea of an open top turret because that means that I'm less likely to bump my head. Uh, but anyway, if we look at the positions that the crew would have been, again, this is a five man crew. So right here is where your loader would have been. Right here is where the gunner sits. And then right here in this seat is where your commander is at. Okay, we're on top of the M36 uh, tank destroyer now. And you can see it's got the open top turret, uh, which is kind of an unusual thing. You might think of an armored vehicle always uh, needing an armored top with hatches. Uh, well, you gotta remember the tank destroyers, their mission was to get in there, knock out a tank and get out of Dodge, as they say. So this also helped with reducing the overall weight of the vehicle. And because this vehicle weighs less than a Sherman, it's kind of like a hot rod. This will do what feels like a fast speed. Now you're actually, your top speed is probably going to be about 26 to 30 miles per hour. Maybe a little more if you're going downhill, uh, but this will go pretty fast relatively for a World War II tank. Uh, but we've got the large 90 millimeter gun here and a lot of the accoutrements for the crew. Uh, which we'll get in and look at uh, here real shortly. Now on the top of the of the uh, the bustle here, you can mount a 50 caliber machine gun. Now this pedestal uh, slides up and will sit vertically here. It's in its travel position right now. And uh, you can have an infantryman up here with a 50 caliber on it. Kind of like Audie Murphy, he was on a tank destroyer. Uh, when he performed his actions that got him uh, the Medal of Honor. So uh, next, we'll go on inside. All right, we're sitting inside of the turret of the M36 tank destroyer, and it is uh, pretty much set up the way it would have been. We've got the large 90 millimeter gun here, and this is quite a bit bigger than the 76 or even the 75 millimeter guns on the Sherman. So it takes up a lot of space here with the breech. Uh, but over here, I'm sitting in the gunner position. Now, one little factoid to remember, Clarence Moyer was a gunner in a Pershing tank and a Sherman, so I'm sitting in his position, if you've read Spearhead. So I'm in charge of firing the gun, aiming the gun, traversing the turret. So I've got the hand crank for traversing the turret here. I can also uh, use the, the hydraulics and maneuver the joystick, if you will, down here for that. Uh, behind me would be the commander and over here would be the loader of the gun. And those are big shells. Behind here, we have the storage for the 90 millimeter shells. We've got the intercom system, binoculars, canteens for the crew. Uh, on board, there's also five M1 carbines for the crew if they need to dismount. Uh, this vehicle's got a fire suppression system, fire extinguishers on board. And then with the open top, it's, you know, we can easily look out if we need to. Um, they also had canvas covers or canvas top, if you will, that would go over the turret. And later in the war and post-war, they put uh, a lightly armored or a steel enclosure over the top, which would fold up when you wanted to open it. Uh, this one did have that when we did uh, acquire it. And one thing I want to mention, I didn't mention earlier, was that in the 90s, uh, a lot of these M36s and M18s were over in Eastern Europe. They were used in the Bosnian Civil War. And a lot of times they were used for the machine guns on board. So when the first collectors in the United States got them in the late 90s, um, a lot of the times there'd be a lot of machine gun shells in here. Um, but they had noticed that the main guns were not used. So this one was over there and um, a lot of people ask, do you know if this vehicle saw combat in World War II? Well, we can't, we can't say that we definitely know that, um, but it's very, very likely that this one was sent over uh, right at the tail end of 1944 and, and received in early 45 and, and saw combat then. Because the 90 was the first large gun that we could use that could really uh, do heavy damage against the larger German tanks. So it was a priority and rushed over overseas from the United States.
All right, now real quick before we get out of this tank destroyer, uh, I want to show the the other parts that we haven't seen yet. So what we are looking at right here, similar to you know a Sherman, this is the driver's position, and then we have the assistant driver over here. So um, yeah, just wanted to to show that before we get out of here. All right, well, there you go. Uh, there's a little bit more right here at the World War II American Experience, uh, northwest of Gettysburg on the Mummusburg Road. I'll probably two, three, four miles. Uh, also, if you uh, are not subscribed to Jared Frederick's channel, uh, Real History, uh, definitely jump over there and subscribe. He's got all kinds of great stuff. If you love movies and you love history, well, my gosh, why wouldn't you? Uh, but anyway, uh, so for now, we're heading off to the next place. Hey, there is way more on this channel that you probably haven't seen, and YouTube seems to think that you'll like this video. So click here to watch the next one, and be sure to subscribe to catch all of the new content when it comes out.